Good evening. My name is Stephen Wolfolk. I'm the Director of Programming and Marketing for the Kansas City Public Library. And it's a pleasure to welcome you back for this latest installment in our virtual signature event series and to introduce our guest tonight, Professor Howard French. Professor French started his journalism career as a freelance reporter for the Washington Post and other publications working out of West Africa. He joined the New York Times in 1986, serving most notably as Bureau Chief for Central America and the Caribbean, West and Central Africa, Japan and the Koreas, and China. Among many other awards, he's a two-time recipient of the Overseas Press Club Award. He's the author of five books, and he joins us tonight to discuss the latest, Born in Blackness, Africa, Africans, and the Making of the Modern World, 1471 to the Second World War. It's a fantastic book, starts out with one simple but profound question. What if we put Africa and Africans at the center of our thinking about the making of the modern world? The answer, he says, is we start to understand how the economic ascendancy of Europe, the anchoring of democracy in the West, and the fulfillment of so-called enlightenment ideals all grew out of Europe's dehumanizing engagement with Africa. The book is available now from all major retailers, but we like to direct people to bookshop.org where your purchase supports independent booksellers across the country. Uh, Professor French, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me. Um, I should mention if anyone has questions tonight, they can drop those in the chat on the YouTube page and we'll get to as many of those as we can. Uh, but right now, Professor, if it's okay with you, I'm going to step aside, let you tell us a little bit about Born in Blackness, and then I will be back for the Q&A. Uh, thank you very much, Stephen. Um, so, um, uh, Stephen Wolfolk, my host for this conversation, and I were having a little um, uh, back and forth just before uh, this uh, went live, uh, and uh, he asked me a question which sort of touches upon where I often start talks like this, which is where did the idea for this book come from? And I asked him what element of the, the book had struck him as, as novel or, or, or different or, or from, from, from what he's used to seeing. And he says, well, you don't normally see books written from uh, a, a non-European perspective about the broad sweep of history. Uh, and I certainly concur with that. And so this sort of opens the door for me to say, that this book is, uh, in the first instance, and most fundamentally, it's an exploration of the question of modernity. And uh, how did the Western world, by which I most particularly mean Western Europe and the United States, um, arrive at a position of such great wealth and power um, in the world compared to every other region? Uh, and so I trace this story's origins back to um, uh, the 15th century, uh, and what was known at that time, what, what was known, what we have called from that time, the age of exploration. Um, and uh, I spent a long time in the research of this book, thinking about and reading about, um, even more uh, particularly recalling the way I had begun to learn about the age of exploration as a, as a youngster, probably um, late in elementary school and through junior high school, I first encountered the tales of exploration by the great uh, navigators of Iberia and the conquistadors who followed in their wake. And these stories, the stories of, of these people um, who emerged from uh, Portugal first and then Spain in the 1400s, culminating at the end of that century, of course, with the most famous of them all, Columbus, um, we are told are the people who set the world uh, on its course uh, toward modernity and set the West on its core on its ascendant course of, of wealth and power above uh, any other part of the world. Um, the, the traditional way this, this, this narrative is told presents Africa um, as merely a geographic obstacle that needs to be uh, overcome, that needs to be circumnavigated. I found this, this kind of description of Africa in work after work as I researched the traditional narratives of, of the, the 15th century and of the age of navigation. And what I found uh, as I went deeper and deeper into the sort of um, archival research of the records of the Portuguese explorers from that very time is a very different story indeed. What the Portuguese were looking for beginning in the 1400s, I'm sorry, in the early 1400s, was not a route around Africa, but instead a route to um, uh, discovery of a source of gold that they believed um, existed um, under the control of a kingdom somewhere in the center of West Africa. 
And so the Portuguese pursued over a series of decades, beginning in the 1420s and 30s, and culminating in 1471, which is a year that um, it, um, figures in the, the subtitle of my book, the Portuguese make their way gradually around the westward bulge of Africa and reach the underside uh, of, of, of the continent, arriving in a place called that we nowadays call Ghana. Ghana was not the name of that place then. Uh, nobody in that area of West Africa thought of themselves as living in Ghana. This is a modern attribution calling it Ghana. Anyway, Ghana is familiar to us, so I'm using it. They arrived in Ghana and they discovered um, even ordinary people walking around wearing uh, abundant gold jewelry. And so the Portuguese had realized their dream as of 1471 to discover enormous uh, wealth in West Africa. Why is this story important? I guess first I should say that the Portuguese got this dream of discovering uh, wealth, a, 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 an extraordinary source of gold in West Africa from um, uh, an incredible series of events that took place in the previous century. So this was a long quest. Not only were the were the Portuguese and subsequent, subsequently the Spanish not primarily trying to find a sea route to Asia, which is what we are normally told, but starting in the 1300s, a century before the great navigators we've just spoken about, they had become obsessed with West Africa as a source of, 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 of wealth because of a pilgrimage by a West African um, sovereign, the head of an empire called the Empire of Mali, who sets off in 1424, I'm sorry, in 1324 for Cairo and for Mecca. Um, and this sovereign's image figures on the cover of my book, Born in Blackness, uh, um, from which is taken, the, a design which is taken from a famous map of that era known as the Catalan Atlas. Mansa Musa sets off from Mali um, to Cairo and Mecca in 1324 uh, with a, an entourage numbering tens of thousands of people uh, and carrying with him many um, uh, tons of gold for distribution as patronage along his route. Uh, Mansa Musa distributes gold in quantities hitherto unheard of. No individual had ever been known to be in possession of such quantities of gold, and he freely handed it out along the way uh, to Muslim clerics, sometimes to ordinary people, to local rulers in societies he encountered along the way to, to Cairo and to Mecca, and, and finally and most abundantly in Cairo itself. And so the story of Mansa Musa spread, first of all, the price of gold uh, collapsed in the Middle East and throughout Europe because of the enormous quantity of gold that he had essentially given away. And the story of this man and of Mali's wealth then spread like a legend uh, throughout uh, the region and beyond into Europe. And this is what led to the creation in 1375 of this famous map, the cover of my book, the Catalan Atlas. And so the Europeans had um, had um, uh, good reason uh, this was not a superstition. This was not uh, fantasy, thinking that there was a king lost away somewhere in the recesses of West Africa in control of large amounts of gold. This was a known fact. And the stories reached Europe, the map was created, and this is what energizes the Portuguese to set out first in exploring the coast of West Africa and finally arriving uh, in Ghana. Um, Portugal was a very weak country at the time. It was a very new kingdom at the time. It had split um, from Castile, which is the precursor of Spain, of course, uh, and Portugal had nothing uh, in terms of economic uh, resources or exports more than, say, salt and dried fish and the cork that you use to make wine bottles. In other words, it was, a, it was an extraordinarily poor country by the standards of, of that time in Europe, also a very small country. And so Portugal was desperate to find the wherewithal to stand up on its own two feet and resist reconquest by Spain and uh, finding a source, finding a way to the source of the gold wealth in West Africa was kind of the, the um, swinging for the fences kind of um, approach that the Portuguese bet all their chips on in order to, to succeed. Um, in the 14, 1410s, 1420s, 1430s, ships begin to go down the coast, as I said, 
These were organized by uh, a very famous Portuguese uh, man, a uh, prince named Henry the Navigator, um, who commissions these voyages. Uh, it takes many years to reach Ghana. Uh, the determination of the Portuguese is attested to the fact that they did not give up. They, this was not a fly-by-night thing. They spent decades trying to discover the gold. And in 1471, they finally arrive in Ghana. And this proof of concept of enormous African wealth is, is confirmed. Extraordinary things are set in motion by these events. First of all, the Portuguese being a weak and poor European nation had very little to trade with that the people, the local people in what we're calling Ghana would, might have desired. And so the Portuguese were able, the Portuguese did not conquer the Ghanaians. They didn't have the means to conquer the Ghanaians. The Ghanaians, as we're calling them, had a pretty sophisticated material cultural of their own. And the Portuguese didn't have many goods that appealed to them. And so the Portuguese had to go back to Europe with some of the gold that they managed to acquire in trade with the Ghanaians and begin opening circuits of trade within Europe to acquire goods from other sources in Europe that would appeal to the Africans. And this is the first major change that occurs in creating what I'm calling the, the, in the impulse that creates the modern world. The first major change is because of African gold secured in Ghana, new circuits of economic exchange are created within Europe between Southern Europe, Iberia, and Northern Europe, especially the so-called low countries, which we now call Netherlands and parts of Belgium and Germany, where the Italian, I'm sorry, where the Portuguese begin to trade for metal goods and some kinds of textiles, which they begin then to ferry back down the African coast to acquire the gold that they wanted to purchase from the Ghanaians. So the second big thing that happens after <clears throat> a, a, um, a decade of this kind of trade, which floats the Portuguese currency, which creates uh, great economic strength in Portugal, uh, which allows Portugal to build lots of new ships and, and undertake new missions of exploration. Um, the second thing that happens is the Portuguese discover um, off the coast of Central Africa, a small a group of islands, uh, which are now known as the na nation of Sao Tome. Um, and the Portuguese who, who had been growing sugar in places like Madeira and in the Canary Islands, far to the north in the Atlantic Ocean, got the idea of planting sugar on Sao Tome. And Sao Tome being an equatorial island that was uninhabited at the time, that was fed by uh, uh, abundant regular rainfall and which had extraordinarily rich uh, volcanic soil uh, proved to be uh, an, uh, an, an ideal sort of almost in undreamed of ways, ideal way, a place for environment, for the growth, for the cultivation of sugar. And this um, becomes the impetus for the creation of what will very quickly thereafter become the Atlantic slave trade. The Portuguese begin to acquire slaves from nearby uh, Central Africa and from West Africa, from two places in particular, from a place called Benin, which was a very sophisticated kingdom in what is now Nigeria, and from Congo, uh, which was a kingdom of that name, but spelled we uh, spelled the, the name of this kingdom nowadays with K, the letter K to distinguish it from the country known as Congo. The, Port the Portuguese acquire slaves from these two places and begin to plant sugar on Sao Tome, and the planting of sugar on Sao Tome is where the, the model of plantation agriculture by enslaved Africans comes together in its full form. Uh, and it is this act, the creation of plantation agriculture, fueled and fired by African labor in chains, which becomes the most important um, economic motor of modernity, I argue. In the year, so this uh, Sao Tome is discovered in the 50, 1470s. It, uh, sugar begins to be grown there to, uh, very soon thereafter. And in 1500, the Portuguese discover Brazil. And so the Portuguese are tacking back and forth across the Atlantic and they hit Brazil pretty much by accident. And within a short period of time thereafter, uh, they hit upon the idea of taking this fantastic crop. I should pause to say sugar was prior to Sao Tome was extraordinarily rare and extraordinarily expensive in Europe. Only royalty and um, members of the court could afford really 
to adorn their tables with sugar. Sugar, what I mean by sugar is refined sugar. Sugar was beyond the means of almost everyone else in the society, so expensive it was. And so, so Sao Tome with this plantation model becomes the laboratory for, for economic development through the exploitation of slaves in the growth of sugar, this extraordinary lucrative crop, the discovery of Brazil then becomes um, a much bigger stage for the growth of uh, sugar in plantations in which slaves are exploited. Um, this provides yet another big fill up to Brazil. We learn um, uh, the stories of the great conquistadors, a word I used several minutes ago in the very beginning of, of, of my conversation with you. Um, uh, the people who conquered um, uh, Cuba and Hispaniola and Bolivia and Peru and Mexico and the stories that we tend to learn in school about that age of conquest is that the gold and the silver that the Spanish brought back from conquering these lands, often with very few troops, are what created enormous wealth in that era for in, in Europe and which made Spain a great power. The fact is that Portugal in Sao Tome and subsequently Brazil made more money, realized bigger profits from the cultivation of sugar by the exploitation of Africans through slavery on plantations than even the Spanish made through the mining of these precious metals. And this kind of, this, the, but the, and I would just say, uh, in addition to the fact that the, 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 the record of the Portuguese profit from this has been effaced from our memories. It, has, it doesn't have the sexiness of the conquistadors. And therefore, at, if, if for no other reason, the, the, the record of this story has been downplayed um, to a point where it's almost been forgotten. But not only was it more profitable than the mining of gold and sugar, it was also more, it provided more linkages to other sectors of the economy, modernizing sectors of the economy. Sugar and the trade in sugar and the employment of slaves, I say employment, that's actually not a great word, the exploitation of slaves because slaves were not, of course, paid, um, uh, fed in Europe the creation of all kinds of modernizing industries, shipbuilding, metalworks, for, simply for the fact of keeping slaves in chains, um, insurance because these cargoes had to be insured, uh, refineries in Spain, I'm sorry, in Europe, um, uh, armaments uh, because um, selling arms became one it, on the African coast became one of the um, primary trade goods that Europeans used to acquire slaves. Um, and so through all of these means, far more than the simple extraction of, of mining uh, via mining of metals like gold and silver in Bolivia, um, sugar plantations provide modernizing linkages that, that have secondary and tertiary payoffs in terms of the economic development and growth for Europe in ways that we have not accounted for in our take, telling of the story of the takeoff of European economies and of subsequent Euro European history. I, I want to just say, um, uh, uh, emphasize, so th this story continues after sugar. Sugar is, because, is the miracle crop the miracle sort of economic stimulus for the next two to two and a half centuries in the European world. Britain follows the, um, Portugal's success in, in Brazil by taking over um, Barbados in 1630. And within 50 years, Barbados, an island that is one fifth or one sixth the size of Long Island here in New York City. Um, a tiny little place, tiny little Barbados through the exploitation of slaves is making more money for Britain than all of the gold and silver that, that Spain had so famously acquired in the Americas. Um, uh, subsequent to that, uh, sugar becomes, uh, it migrates throughout the Caribbean. Uh, the English take over Jamaica from Spain and they grow even more sugar in, in Jamaica than they had in Barbados. And the French take over Hispaniola subsequently Haiti, and they grow more sugar and other slave produced crops like cocoa and coffee in, in Haiti than uh, or for a value greater yet again than all of the wealth taken out via metals from, from, from Spanish America. 
Um, uh, we this story, the plantation model. I don't have time to walk through each successive stage of it, but it of course culminates in the United States. In 1804, uh, Haitian slaves rise up. Um, these are actually enslaved Africans. The life expectancy of a slave on uh, Haitian soil uh, in that era in the 18th century was less than seven years, which is how badly they were worked, how, mercil how mercilessly they were exploited. Um, and so almost all of the people who worked in sugar and other product, uh, commodity production like coffee and cocoa who had been brought to uh, had been brought from Africa were actually culturally Africans at the time of their labor. They had not had time to have children or to assimilate into any new world culture. These people in Haiti who rose up in 1804 to rebel against French overlordship and uh, create the first slave uh, born republic in the history of the world, their victory opened up the Western United States um, for um, uh, the early colonies because Napoleon, by virtue of being defeated by the slaves, had was uh, experienced a financial crisis and he had to sell, I like to use the word, in a fire sale sort of uh, um, set of circumstances because um, he had lost so much money in trying to put down slave rebellion in Haiti. Um, he had to sell all or part of 15 territories, which became American states um, uh, that had been part with that were held within the Louis Louisiana Purchase. And it is when the United States under Thomas Jefferson acquired these territories that cotton becomes the next big economic miracle of the West. Cotton then displaces sugar. Uh, beginning in beginning in the early decades of the 1800s and becomes the most important export of the United States in this period by far, by an immense distance. Um, and so this is the story um, which begins, as I said, with the discovery, with the pursuit of discovery of wealth in Africa, not the story that we are normally told about how to get around Africa and to reach fabled wealth in Europe and which arrives, which, which um, then leads to the creation of new models of economic production bound up in the enslavement of Africans, bound up in plantation production. And it is via this succession of great crops from sugar, which was dominant again for two, two and a half centuries, to then cotton, which I argue become the major motors of Western ascendancy. Um, and um, I know that there will be questions, but there's one more piece that I want to emphasize before I stop here. And that is that this wasn't just a, a, a matter of generating enormous fortunes for Europe, which in fact it was, but it is also a matter of changing the culture of Europe. And what do I mean by changing the culture of Europe? Um, prior to, uh, these, uh, to, to the production of these great commodity crops through slave labor on plantations, uh, people in in Britain and other and Europeans and other parts of that continent commonly drank alcoholic uh, beverages during the daytime during the workday, and that is because they did not have access to sanitary water. Water supplies, clean water supplies, were not um, reliable uh, or abundant, and so people drank ale in England and wine in France during the workday, which had enormous consequences, as you can imagine, for their productivity um, uh, in, in the workplace. With the arrival of sugar, with the arrival of coffee um, via slave labor on these plantations in Brazil first and then in Barbados and subsequently in other places, beginning in the early 1600s, uh, the European diet is completely transformed. Um, and in 1650, the first coffee shop opens up in Oxford in England. And someone in Oxford, some entrepreneur, oh, I'm, let me pause this, I'm correct myself. It was not an entrepreneur in Oxford. The first coffee shop is indeed in Oxford, but they uh, coffee shops as a business idea spread very rapidly to London and then throughout um, England. And some clever entrepreneurs in London get the idea that we have these stimulated people who are sitting in coffee shops, drinking coffee that is um, sweetened with sugar and probably smoking tobacco, another slave grown crop and another stimulant. And instead of being rowdy and somnolent from drinking ale, 
they're lively and they want to have discussions about the affairs of the day. And so me, Mr. Uh, clever Entrepreneur, I get the idea that I can sell them a sheet, a printed sheet with the news of the moment and I'll have a captive audience. Here in these events, we have the birth of the newspaper. Uh, the first coffee shop again is in 1650 in, in Oxford. The first coffee shops in London are very quickly thereafter. And the first newspapers follow almost immediately on their heels. And this is not by coincidence. These are all the unanticipated, unexpected and untold fruits of the exploitation of Africans through slavery and plantation agriculture that have been omitted from the history that we learn about how we have arrived in the current moment. So I think I'll pause there and allow uh, Stephen you uh, to resume with some questions and maybe get in with the audience. Absolutely. Um, again, if you have questions, you can drop those in the chat and we'll get to as many of those as we can. Um, but I want to start here. We were talking before the program about why this African point of view hasn't really been shared previously. And that's partially the fact that the victors write the history, but you said that there's more to it in this case. Yes, yeah, so the, 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 the victors, um, you know, uh, I, I, I like to think about human nature uh, in trying to understand this. And as I understand human nature, um, I think it is very common for us as individuals, as it is for us uh, in uh, whatever society we come from, to look uh, for, within ourselves for reasons for our success. We like to find stories that involve our own virtues, our own sacrifice, our own enterprise, our own genius where it exists, our own um, sweat uh, um, to explain how uh, we merit uh, whatever we have earned in life, right? Uh, and this is as true for the individual, I think, or for the society, I think, as it is for the individual. And so the story of Western success, as we have been taught it, uh, involves at one, on one level, this, this rather innocent and unremarkable phenomenon. Um, it's not just the victors telling their own history. It's, I think every society, like every individual, looks for the positive within themselves to explain whatever fruits of success they have had. The other piece of it, though, is a, is a bit more problematic and, to me, more troublesome. <clears throat> and that is that I believe that if you follow the um, thread of my narrative, uh, which involves very quickly um, uh, the, the, the exploitation of Africans on a very large scale uh, and involves also very quickly the production of wealth on an extraordinarily large scale, uh, then um, you, you, come, you are quickly confronted with the fact that this was only accomplished via horror also on a very large scale. Uh, what do I mean by horror on a very large scale? So it is con commonly understood now uh, that approximately 12.5 million Africans were landed in chains in the Americas and delivered to plantation slavery in the Americas. Um, it is also believed, and I sort of document all of this in the book, that perhaps another 40% of that number died on African soil in, in attempts of various kinds to generate uh, a traffic in the slaves to get enough people on the ships to 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 arrive at a number like 12.5 billion people, right? Uh, it is also believed that perhaps 15 or 20 percent of the people, um, there are a whole range of estimates on this, but none of them are small figures. Let's say 15 to 20 percent of the people who were put onto ships to cross the Atlantic to become enslaved peoples in the Americas died at sea. Uh, it is also known that there was a period of what was called seasoning, where uh, it, Africans freshly brought from that continent to the Americas were, were quarantined in the New World before they were put to the most rigorous kinds of exploitation. And they died in a new disease environment in hor horrid numbers in this quarantine before they ever reached the field. And so we are talking about the loss of life on, uh, on, on, on just by, by historical standards on an incredible scale. We're talking, okay, if we just do the math really quickly, 12.5 plus 40% of that number is gonna get you up into the 16, 17 million people. 
uh, and then um, uh, add on the seasoning and death at sea. So we're, we're getting close to 20 million people. Um, this is at a time, this was, so, uh, in my book, I developed a demographic theory of what this all meant for Africa. And I was about to say, this is at a time when the African population overall for the entire continent was perhaps about 100 million people. So Africa lost 20 million people, one in five people, perhaps in that ballpark to the experience of exploitation via plantation slavery. My theory is in answer to your question that when you, when you're when one is responsible for horror on that scale, it requires enormous effort to dehumanize the victims and dehumanize the victims means a few things. It means pretending that they never had any civilization to begin with. It means pretending that they made no appreciable contribution to your civilization. It means pretending that their stories don't matter. It means pretending that they don't have any stories uh, because uh, the alternative means coming to terms with the, the scale of the horror that was perpetrated. And just as human beings would like to think nice things about how they became successful, they would also equally like to avoid unpleasant um, realities about uh, more nefarious um, experiences that might have accounted for their success. And so you have this combination of these plus, these uh, positive and negative motivations for wiping out the African accounts or, or the accounts of Africans in the experience of everything that I've I've discussed so far. I wonder also if 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 the victors are writing that history and if they're writing that history with the the goal of being seen as the the heroes of the story. Um, how does that impact the typical Americans' understanding of exactly how brutal slavery was? I think we think of slavery as a brutal institution. Do you think Americans really fully understand exactly how brutal it was? Um, I don't think that they understand how beautiful, be, I'm sorry, um, brutal it was. Uh, uh, I don't think that most Americans understand how large scale a phenomenon it was. I don't think most Americans know uh, anything about the numbers that I've just discussed. Um, let me give you another way, however, of coming at this question. You know, if you turn on certain TV networks nowadays, you will find commonplace remarks about um, uh, a, a sort of conspiracy theories about replacement. Like the, there are various ideas about replacing the real Americans. And it is implied that the real Americans, even when it is not said overtly, it is implied that the real Americans all or mostly all came from a particular part of the world. And if you follow the sort of logic of this conspiratorial mindset, um, you, you, you arrive back in Europe that America was created by Europeans. And we even have, I think one Congressman who said not long ago that the native Americans never amounted to anything and never did anything. And various other people have said the Africans never did anything that the slaves never accounted for very much. Um, this is a compact of ideas that, it, that, 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 that sort of um, work in synergy with each other, that preserve ourselves from inspecting the horror that I spoke of and for understanding the fruits that we enjoy in our civilization today and where they derive from. There's a statistic that really helps us understand this very well, I think, which, which I believe will surprise a lot of your, your listeners, and that is that up until 1820, four times more people had arrived on American soil, meaning in the new world, than Europeans. Four, I'm sorry, four times more from Africa than from Europe. Four times more people had been brought to the new world from Africa up by the year 1820 than from Europe. So where were the real people coming from? I don't personally believe there's a real American story, right? I believe we're all real Americans, but this is an answer to that conspiratorial viewpoint. Four times more people were brought from Africa prior to 1820 than Europeans. And that means that it, that helps us understand the extent to which it was the labor, it was the sweat, it was the blood, it was the suffering, it was ultimately the death of those people brought from Africa who helped 
make America viable, economically speaking, who made the West viable as a compact. What do I mean by compact? I mean a condominium between Europe and North America, that North America would not have been remotely as profitable or viable, economically speaking, for Europeans had there not been this uh, component of, uh, of, of a four to one ratio of Africans who were brought here and died, not just working in plantations, but clearing forests, cutting roads, um, doing every manner of unpleasant labor that you can imagine in order to make the Americas viable economically. Uh, and just one final piece, Stephen, to this question. Um, uh, we, another thing we don't really understand through what we learn in school is the degree to which the 13 original American colonies were utterly economically dependent on, on trade with the Caribbean island slave economies in this era, in the era, era of colonial America. Britain did not allow America to sell finished goods to back into the British economy. And so the 13 colonies sent uh, both finished goods and agricultural products to these sugar islands where the land was rendered so valuable from the production of sugar that it didn't make sense to grow any other crops. And so uh, wheat, um, livestock, um, uh, furniture, um, uh, all sorts of comestibles uh, were um, uh, the mainstay of the American economy was furnishing these islands with those goods. And without the demand created from the slave islands, uh, the American economy in, in this era of 13, I'm sorry, in this era of 13 colonies would itself have been unviable. So there's this extraordinary story that one once one begins chipping away, that we arrive at, which shows that the very engine of economic growth and economic progress for these American societies that we're talking about was premised on slavery. And you said that the African voices, uh, one is unaccustomed to hearing the African side of the story, but when you begin to explore the archives, as I did in the research of this book, the one really astounding thing that begins to happen is that in the 16th and 17th centuries, Europeans acknowledged, first of all, that they were encountering and treating with very sophisticated societies on the African mainland. And then subsequently, they, uh, and I quote many of them, um, uh, readily acknowledge that slavery was the motor of everything. Uh, there are these remarkable quotes in my book from leading French, leading English, and subsequently British thinkers who said, one of them says that the slave that the economy built in slavery was the fundamental prop of everything that agitates the universe. Um, and so this idea of effacing, of erasing, of avoiding uh, uh, recognizing, of uh, deliberately denying, these are relatively recent phenomena. The, the chroniclers of the period when this kind of exploitation was at its height, understood its importance to Europe and to Western civilization. You write about this a little bit in your book, but, but somebody wonders if this idea of slavery, if it came naturally to Europeans, if they, if they immediately were on board with this, um, and you, you say not necessarily, but it was kind of alarming how quickly they did, right? Well, I mean, the first thing to be said is that Europeans had long practiced slavery themselves um, among Europeans. Um, and uh, so, so it was not as if Europeans arrived in Africa kind of innocent of the idea that uh, there was an institution called slavery. Um, uh, there's a long history of slavery in Europe. Um, uh, it was still a recent history in Europe at the time when African slavery takes off. But the way that slavery begins, the, the thread that leads to the transatlantic slave trade, meaning slaves brought from Africa into the New World, is a is a, is a subtle and complicated one. The Europeans, the Portuguese were not initially looking to sell or to buy slaves. The Portuguese were looking for gold, as I said. Prince Henry the Navigator, Portugal was a poor country. Prince Henry the Navigator was, was taking a long shot gamble that he could discover this source of African gold based on this fabulous map, the Catalan Atlas, 
uh, and it was costing a lot of money and he was not finding gold. His ships were not finding gold. And so uh, they, his men were desperate to bring something back that could be sold. And they begin trying to capture slaves in various places uh, in, on the Western bulge of Africa near Senegal and Guinea-Bissau and places, Liberia, places like that. And, and so when they bring these slaves back to Portugal, they discover that Portugal, re remember this is in the era not too far removed from the Black Death in Europe, when the European population was decimated from disease, there was an enormous demand for manpower or for labor, I should say, in Europe. And so this was not an intentional thing. They bring back some slaves or they bring back some captives and they discover that they can sell them for slaves. And before the, well before the transatlantic slave trade begins, there's this lively trade in, in captured Africans that the Portuguese are bringing back to, 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 to Faro, which is in far southern uh, Portugal and to Lisbon, ultimately to Lisbon and selling them throughout Southern Europe. And this results at, at in, in you know, less than a century with the population of Portugal, of I should say of Lisbon being itself 10% black. That's how lively the slave trade was. This is before the transatlantic slave trade begins, but the transatlantic slave trade itself begins because um, the Portuguese had discovered, and this is sort of the proximate answer to your question, the Portuguese had discovered in their, in their eagerness to buy gold from this place we're calling Ghana, they had discovered that the people of Ghana were willing to buy other Africans so that they could put those Africans to work um, mining and transporting gold so that they, the Ghanaians could generate even more trade with Europe for metal goods and textiles and things like that, that they wanted through these economic circuits that I had spoken about earlier in our conversation. And so the, for the Portuguese, this is a kind of a eureka moment that the Africa, we don't have to capture the Africans. We don't have to go, you know, at great risk to ourselves and try to, you know, militarily seize Africans. Uh, the Af certain African societies will actually sell us slaves if we offer them the right conditions and the right terms and the right goods. And so this becomes the sort of the, the proximate germ of this mass commerce in, in enslaved peoples. And the Portuguese begin to buy slaves here and there, first for sale in Ghana, and then to employ them, I, I made the mistake of using that word employ, to exploit them on Sao Tome, where they begin to grow sugar, and then sub, sub, subsequently to fuel their plantations in Brazil and elsewhere. The Portuguese, Portugal becomes a superpower in the slave trade as a result of all of this. An interesting thing we discover along the way is that a number of African societies very quickly after having willingly engaged in the trade in, in enslaved peoples, decide it's no longer for them. This kingdom of Benin, which I described or what I referred to earlier, shuts down the slave trade. They said, we don't want to do this anymore. We're not going to sell you our slaves. It's too disruptive. Congo tries to do this. Subsequently, Congo, the kingdom, which is spelled with a K, and this sets off an enormous war between Congo and Portugal, which takes place over a period of roughly 100 years, where the Portuguese tried to conquer and subdue the Congolese because so rich was the supply in slaves from Central Africa that they didn't want to relinquish it. And the Congolese kingdom, uh, enormously uh, sophisticated for this era, even by European standards, then engages in alliances with with, with just utterly remarkable with, with Holland to fight against Portugal. The Congolese sovereign initiates this diplomacy, which results in an alliance with Holland in order to, to defeat the Portuguese so that, the, so that Congo can escape the grips of the slave trade. Uh, these are the sorts of stories I tell around your question in the book. We have another audience question here. Do you think the marginalization of Africa continues today? And if so, what, what form does it take? Uh, the marginalization of Africa definitely takes continues today. Um, uh, uh, as, as strikingly as ever. Um, uh, how, can I, um, how can I substantiate this? Uh, a few ways. Uh, one of them is, um, so, a previous book of mine is about China's engage, engagement with Africa, which uh, has um, uh, 
aroused many criticisms in the West and with a lot of people decrying what they see as a kind of new colonization of Africa, which is a term that I, I don't subscribe to. I think that, that China's engagement with Africa is huge and ambitious uh, and um, uh, sort of whole of continent in terms of uh, the kinds of investment and diplomatic engagements that China has launched into. And because it is so huge and ambitious, it involves pluses and negatives. There are bad things one can point to that China has done in Africa, and there are good things that one can point to that China is doing or has done in Africa. But the, the contrast I want to establish with you in response to the question is, are, is Africa being marginalized or ignored? Every year since the 1990s, a Chinese president or a pre prime minister has visited several African countries every single year up until COVID, every single year. Uh, every year, several Chinese cabinet members or the equivalent of what we call our cabinet make uh, tours of the African continent, several countries. American presidents don't even manage on average to visit Africa once per term. Um, when American leaders meet with African leaders, they typically um, convene a meeting where they get five or six African leaders together because, um, well, one can only surmise because that is the only way that it could amount, it could be worth an American leader's time to meet with an African leader. Oh, we'll gather five or six of them that way, you know, we can have a conversation, it'll be worthwhile. Um, so, so this is one way to, to, to understand how marginalized Africa is in terms of the American attention span. There's, an, there's yet another way. Africa today is 1.4 billion or so people. Africa in 2050, according to the United Nations, is going to be 2, 2.5 billion people. Africa at the end of this century, and the margin of error in demographic projections is not enormous, but it's substantial. So you have a range. The projections by very serious demographers for the end of the century population of Africa is between 3 and 5 billion people. We are talking about more people than live in China and India combined. Um, how many people are studying Africa in the United States right now? How many American publications have bureaus in Africa? How many diplomats uh, are, uh, specialize in Africa in the American foreign policy uh, and foreign service? How many intelligence assets does the United States deploy in Africa? How many American universities are deeply engaged with Africa? I think the answer to all of those questions points toward a relative neglect, uh, especially when measured against the size of the continent and of the mounting demography of the continent. And what we risk seeing is that if we don't find a way to engage Africa positively now, we are going to arrive at um, some horrible outcomes in the future. Horrible outcomes can mean a couple of things. Horrible outcomes can mean Africa has not been integrated into the global economy in the way that it needs to be. And therefore, uh, with this burgeoning population, you will see tremendous and disorderly outflows of refugees and migrants. Or negative outcomes can mean something much more selfish for the United States. Middle classes are growing in many African countries, even though there are other kinds of problems of instability and poverty on the African continent, obviously. There are also, there's this parallel story of enormous growth of middle of cities and of middle classes throughout Africa. So another more selfish way of thinking about a negative outcome is. The United States has failed to imagine Africa as being a place worth paying attention to, and it loses out by not engaging with the mounting energy and the mounting consumer base and the mounting population of these cities in ways that would profit the United States as much as it profits Africa. So we're, we're coming to the end of our hour here, and I want to remind people that the, the book is available everywhere, but uh, we hope you'll you'll find it at bookshop.org or check it out from the library. Uh, I, I want to close with this. Uh, we've talked a lot about how the, the exploitation of Africans led to the, the economic rise and, and all of the positive things that have happened in Europe and in the United States since, but at the same time, it was... Uh, responsible for the, the systematic uh, 
destruction of multiple cultures that have never really recovered. Can you can you talk a little bit about that angle, that side of things? Sure. Uh, so, so I spoke about um, the African demography a little while ago. I said that you know at the height of the slave trade, the the African population, continent wide, is thought to have been roughly about 100 million people. And that for the sake of discussion, let's ballpark say that, you know, 20 million people were extracted from Africa for the purposes of exploitation, mostly in plantation agriculture. And we talked obviously about what this did in terms of benefiting the West, right? Well, what did it do in terms of harming Africa? Uh, when you talk about a, a demographic landscape where one in five people disappear uh, through uh, violence, um, you are talking about the destruction of, you're talking about destruction on multiple levels. First of all, you're talking about the destruction of societies, which was the first most immediate sense of your question. The Kingdom of Congo, uh, 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 just for one example, one that I explore at some length in my book, um, which um, had a, a great and sophisticated sense of governance, which was as, as extensive geographically speaking as all of Great Britain in the 15th century, which had a legal system, including codified laws, uh, which had diplomats, which were sent to Europe uh, and, and uh, ev eventually had priests, which were um, uh, recognized by the Vatican, so in one case, even buried in the Vatican. You had sophisticated societies which were utterly ripped apart, and in their place, what you had, uh, or, or 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 what uh, occurred was the implantation of um, social distrust on an enormous scale. At, Europeans were not buying Africans because they sent conquering armies to go in and capture them. They got the Afri these this twenty million or so people by selling enticing things to Africans in order to encourage one society to fight against its neighbor. And in the century long pursuit of human beings, this way, Europeans sowed not only the disintegration of, of potentially great societies here and there all across Africa, but also the, the, the disintegration of, 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 of something more basic, just a kind of common fabric of decency and of social trust. Um, uh, and, and I argue in my book that this has had um, a, a deep legacy in terms of stability in Africa. It's commonly remarked people who don't know anything about Africa think they know that Africa is this place of great instability. Well, if you map the parts of Africa that have experienced the greatest political instability over the, in the independence era, let's say starting around 1960, those are precisely the places where the slave trade was most intense. And I argue that this is not a coincidence, that this is a continuation of the ravages of setting one person, one, kind, one group of people against another uh, in the, you know, literally selling them down the river. That, that, that the whole, this notion of African tribalism, where one tribe has this seething hatred of another tribe has many of its roots in this experience. And that this is a very damaging legacy that is with the continent even now today. Professor French, um, this was great. Uh, the book is fantastic. I hope everybody checks it out. Uh, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you, Steve. Good night, everybody.